Janet Lanyon started her career studying gum leafed eating koalas. It wasn't until a chance meeting with the marine biologist that she decided to swap out her eucalypt forests for seagrass meadows. This began a lifetime quest into unravelling the mysteries of one of the ocean's most elusive creatures. So there's so many questions to ask you about all the research and amazing work that you've done over the years. Well, I started doing research on koalas and I was really interested in how they eat eucalyptus leaves because not many animals can do that. Mm -hmm. And so they have a series of adaptations regard, you know, their teeth and their gut and so on that allow them to eat eucalypt leaves. And it was, I really enjoyed doing that research, but I was a really keen scuba diver and I was spending more and more time okay. in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in changing my research into the marine field. And so I went to visit a professor who worked on whales and seals, but he wasn't there at the time. And so I happened to meet someone else who was a dugong expert. And that was Helene Marsh from James Cook University. And when, as I started talking to Helene, I realized that dugongs are really similar to koalas. And in fact, they're like marine koalas. Really? And the reason is that um, they're both highly specialist feeders. So not many animals can feed on seagrass, just like not many animals can feed on eucalyptus. And so I was really interested in how dugongs can eat that unusual diet. I mean, we knew they ate seagrass, we knew that they were found in coastal situations, but we didn't know much else. So when I started the research with Helene, I started investigating their seagrass diet. So. Mm -hmm you know, where seagrass grew and seasonal patterns in seagrass. But I wanted to know some really basic things like how do they eat seagrass, you know, how do they use their teeth and how do they use their guts. Mm -hmm. Dugongs are such interesting animals. So cute, like only its mother could love it kind of thing. It's like a bulldog fascination for me. <laughs> so how would you describe these animals? So dugongs are probably about the same size as, as a dolphin, so mm -hmm. up to about three metres long, but don't look like dolphins. They've got, um, their colour is um, brown through, a, to, through to a light grey. Um, their head's the most unusual part. They've got quite a blunt face um, with a very large upper lip. Um, which forms a big rostral disc. And that lip has a lot of very um, fine sensory hairs, which they use to find the seagrass. Mm -hmm. um, they've got, um, quite, the head's quite large and bulbous. They've got quite small eyes. So they don't have great eyesight. They've got a little ear holes, probably good hearing. They've got um, nostrils situated up on the top of the head so that they mm -hmm. can come to the surface and take a breath without exposing much of their body. Mm -hmm. They're quite streamlined in shape but quite rotund compared to a dolphin. Uh, they have pectoral fins which are like paddles and the females have teats that are located under the pectoral fins um, in the axilla region. Um, the back is tapers off to the tail and the tail is like a dolphin's. So it's a forked tail and when they swim they move that tail up and down. Mm -hmm. The hairs on them on their um, their mouth parts are the most sensitive hairs ever measured in any mammals, and they use those hairs to locate seagrass on the sea in, on the sea floor oh. in murky waters. Okay. So they can feel their seagrass. How, how do you how do you figure out how they use their their guts? Okay, so <laughs> back then we didn't have a way of doing close-up work on dugongs mm -hmm. because they were so secretive and we weren't really sure where they were or even how many there were around. So we had to do everything in a hands-off way. So we had to collect dead animals. So we'd go out and get animals that were stranded and, and come back and cut them open and look at their guts. Um, I worked at museums looking at the skulls and the teeth. 
Um, and I did a lot of work on seagrass. So mm -hmm. I'd be out on mud flats and measuring seagrass every few weeks and mm -hmm. taking photos of seagrass and that sort of thing. The other thing that we did was aerial surveys of dugongs. Mm -hmm. So none of the work was really getting close to a dugong at all. No. Oh, how long was it before that you actually saw your first dugong? Well, actually, I did my entire PhD, which was about six years, on dugongs without ever having got close to a live dugong. Yeah. And you were working around Brisbane mainly for your research? Uh, mainly up around Townsville, actually. Okay, yeah. Mm. No, so if animals came in dead stranded, Helene and I would get notice that mm -hmm. there were dead marine mammals or sometimes turtles on the beach. And so we'd put on our overalls. So Helene had red overalls and I had blue overalls and we'd <laughs> head out with our bucket of knives and the four wheel drive and we'd collect the animals and bring them back to the university. Mm -hmm. And one of the main things we were trying to do was work out the cause of death. Mm -hmm. but we were also interested in getting as much biological information from them as we could. So you'd collect what were, whatever was inside the intestine as well? Yeah, that's right, to later. see what they were feeding on. You must have a very strong stomach. Yeah, I suppose. Kind of I mean, old um, dead dugongs smell pretty bad actually. <laughs> and in fact, you can't get the smell off you for sometimes days, no matter how many times you wash yourself. You haven't managed to find a remedy for that kind of thing, like bathe in tomato sauce or something? No, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Oh, that's terrible. So it sounds like it must have been faint, really, how it all came across, because you were there looking for someone that wasn't there, and you just happened to meet Helene, yeah, who it was... introduced you to this mm -hmm. new world. Yep, yeah, that's right. It was mm -hmm. just a happy accident, really. Mm -hmm. So what I've heard about dugongs is that they're very elusive and mysterious. Um, is that much of their, their character that you found? Yeah, dugongs are really shy and secretive and they're found in usually murky water areas, so they're really difficult to study. So that was one of the reasons that we had to use aerial surveys and, and study dead animals because we just couldn't get close to them. So how would you describe a typical dugong environment? Dugongs prefer um, sheltered shallow waters so they're found in coastal embayments and along sheltered parts of the coast so they're found in quite large numbers along the coast of central and north Queensland because the, the, that coastline's um, sheltered by the, the Great Barrier Reef. Mm -hmm. Um, they're usually found in waters less than five metres deep and they tend to prefer feeding in water about one to three metres. But having said that, we sometimes find them off the coast um, in waters as deep as about 30 metres or so, if their preferred seagrass species are found there. Oh, okay, so they can dive down to 30 metres just to feed along the bottom? Yeah, that's right. Um, I think the record has been about 36 metres. So, and the reason, we haven't actually seen the dugongs at 36 metres, but we've seen their feeding trails. So oh, okay. the scars that they leave through the seagrass beds as they feed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they don't absolutely demol demolish the seagrass bed. Yeah, it depends. So individual animals will leave pretty distinctive feeding trails mm -hmm. and you can see them. If you get a herd of dugongs feeding, then they can pretty much demolish an area because they're going through, you know, sometimes a hundred animals yep. all feeding together. And so it's difficult to see individual feeding trails. Okay. And does it take long for the seagrass to regrow back? Some seagrass takes a while to grow back, but the seagrass species that dugongs prefer to eat are the ones that grow back the fastest. So we call those pioneer species mm -hmm. because they grow back after there's been, there's been a disturbance, such as grazing. Mm -hmm. So they're quick to grow. They don't lay down a lot of fibre or you know, difficult to digest material, and, and so dugongs really like those. Mm -hmm. They also tend to be high in sugars and also in um, amino acids or proteins. To study dugongs, we've really had to be sort of dugong detectives and try and work out other ways to study them because dugongs are in the water all the time and they're underwater pretty much all the time as well. How long can they hold their breath for? 
Usually when they're feeding it's a minute or two but they can hold their breath for up to about 10 or 11 minutes but that's un probably more unusual so okay. one to four minutes right. but when they come to the surface they only come up for a second or so so it's really hard oh, to get a fast. good look at them. Oh. I've actually got a couple of images here you mentioned aerial photos I've got an image here of here we go that so when you're flying around mm -hmm. You can spot this herd of dugongs in the water and do you then automatically think that there must be some seagrass around there or yeah, actually, that special type? Yeah, dugongs are a really good guide that they're, to us that there are particular types of seagrass in the area because dugongs are really fussy eaters. They'll only eat certain types of seagrass. Mm -hmm. So for instance, there, there's a particular species that they really like. It's just a small oval leaf seagrass and they'll eat that over pretty much anything else if it's available. Okay, I've got a couple of, because I guess I go scuba diving um, quite a bit and I do often see a lot of seagrass. Is that, just yeah. to point out the actual differences between these seagrass, I've got a couple of points Okay, there. so they quite like this seagrass, yeah. um, but this one here is their real favorite. And oh, okay. It's a really small seagrass, so it's a, the genus is called Holophila, and the leaves are only about a centimetre or so yeah. long, and it's usually found in, in a sparse sort of seagrass meadow like that, and in sandy or muddy areas. And so you've got this dugong that's, you know, 600, 600 kilos or so, feeding on these tiny little seagrass leaves, and they'll feed on those over thicker, denser seagrass well, meadows I, if I've they can. Well, I've seen that, and I just, they are quite little. Yeah, that's right. So how, how much of that would they need to nourish themselves? Okay, well, we've done some experiments actually where we've measured their energy needs and metabolic rate and so on. And we know that each dugong needs between 25 and 40 kilos of that every single day. So they have to dig up huge amounts. Yeah. So they must be quite, I guess they, they've got a kind of a snout, so are they, they're, are they more like a vacuum cleaner or yeah, are they almost. more of a shovel? Yeah, well, <laughs> sort of a cross, I think. So yeah, that's a good way of describing them. So they, they're able to dig up the entire plant and because they're feeding on these low fibre seagrasses, they're, they're breaking up the seagrass with their mouth parts as they're, putting it, uh, as they're swallowing it, I suppose you'd say. And so they're able to, to take in really large quantities of seagrass mm -hmm. while they're diving. You know? mm -hmm. So they just go along and almost like hoover up the seagrass from, from the sea floor. Mm -hmm. And it's a really neat strategy because they don't need to come to the surface to chew which is really good for a bottom feeding animal. They can just okay. dig up the seagrass as they go and swallow it. Yeah, yeah. However, if they're feeding on um, high fiber um, seagrass, it's often found in more dense meadows, yeah. um, then they can't break it down as easily and it pretty much comes through the gut undigested. And is that also the same for their, um, I guess their cousin, would it be their cousin, the manatee? Oh, Are they manatees. also similar? Well, no, manatees and dugongs are really different. So what I didn't mention was that dugongs have really pathetic teeth. They're the smallest teeth ever recorded for, a, for mammals um, as a function of body size. Oh. And they're really soft and small and they, they don't really do much chewing at all. So dugongs have these big horny pads which process the low fibre seagrass. Manatees, on the other hand, have fantastic teeth. They have this, these huge, big... Um, molars that are enamel coated and they're really hard and manatees can eat pretty much anything. Mm, wow. So they're and, really different. And you've been over um, I guess in the northern hemisphere and done some research on manatees as well. Yeah. Like what are the main differences between dugongs and manatees other than their teeth? Oh well quite a few actually so when you look at them manatees well the, the ones that are best known are Florida manatees um, Florida manatees are huge compared to dugongs mm -hmm. and they're, they're much um, slower. Uh, they live in more coastal and freshwater environments and in fact they move between freshwater rivers and streams and the sea, whereas dugongs are only found in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Dugongs are really slow breeders, manatees breed quite quickly. Yeah. 
Are there any uh, physical attributes that yeah. are different? Manatees have um, paddle-shaped tails, and dugongs have tails that are, are, are of tail flukes that are shaped like a dolphin's. Mm -hmm. Manatees still have um, fingernails on their front flippers, oh, rather like they? an elephant, yeah. um, and their their heads are quite different mm -hmm. too. Oh, you mentioned elephant. I think I heard somewhere that the elephant is actually. Um, closely related to the dugong. Yeah, is that right? right? Yep. Oh. So, so <laughs> elephants and dugongs and manatees all share a common ancestor. So they all evolved from the same type of animals. Wow. The skin of these animals is really thick and sort of leathery and wrinkled, like a yeah. like an elephant's skin, but also naked skin. Um, also, they've got really heavy, dense bones. Um, pretty good for animals that are feeding in shallow water for buoyancy control. Mm -hmm. um, they have tusks, as, uh, dugongs oh. have tusks as well. Manatees don't have tusks, but dugongs do. Yeah. So that's a sort of an elephantine yes. feature. Wow. So those um, tusks would be, they're, would they also be made of like similar like ivory yeah, or something? Yeah, they are. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So they have a pair of permanent incisors, so front teeth, that continually grow throughout their lives. Mm -hmm. But they only erupt in the males. So mm -hmm. when the male dugongs reach adolescence, then their tusks erupt. Erupt. Okay. Are there any uh, dugongs sorry, on the western side or is it just on the east coast that you find? So dugongs are found right around the northern coast of Australia. Mm -hmm. So from um, Moreton Bay on the east coast, right up north, right up through, you know, past Cape York Peninsula and through Torres Strait, over to Western Australia and down as far as Shark Bay. And in fact, dugongs are the most common uh, marine mammal that we have in Australian waters. And people oh, don't really? really know that. No, you didn't know that because I, because they're on, they're a threatened species though. All of the um, manatees and dugongs are threatened. Mm -hmm. um, globally, dugongs are listed um, as being vulnerable to extinction. But what we think is probably more the case is that they're endangered or cr even critically endangered in some areas. And in fact, there are some areas where local populations are no more. So they've become exterminated. Mm. So exterminated through hunting, um, through... Hunting, habitat loss, a number of different threats. And the threats to dugongs are pretty locally specific. Mm -hmm. So the threats to dugongs um, in Australia are quite different to the threats to dugongs in, say, Southeast Asia mm -hmm. or over on the coast of East Africa. Okay. Because that's... Well, I guess with the threats for the dugongs, it's it's not like the dugongs are very exotic in the sense that you have to travel so far and wide to try and find them. They're just right off the coast. Yeah. So the Gold Coast and Brisbane, for example, are like uh, built up major cities right on the coast and you could just drop in and happen to see a dugong. I know at Harvey Bay, you just come out of the marina and there are dugongs right there. Yeah. Dugongs follow the seagrass, basically. So if, if an area loses its seagrass habitat, then they're, it's going to lose their dugongs as well. Yeah. And so, for instance, there are some places, um, including here off the coast of Brisbane, where we think there used to be a lot of dugongs living really close to the coast next to the city of Brisbane. Mm -hmm. But because of increased boating traffic and coastal development, there's been loss of seagrass there and disruptions to, to feeding dugongs. Like you've been studying the dugongs and their seagrass for almost 40 years. Have you noticed anything um, that correlates to climate change or the warming? With Look, I haven't done any work looking at temperature effects on seagrass, but one thing I do see with climate change occurring is that we see an increased um, frequency and severity of storms. Okay. Um, these huge and, and severe rainfall events that we have and have had along the coast of Queensland cause coastal flooding and these floods have major impacts on the seagrass. So basically you've got huge amounts of fresh water running off the coast and the, the salinity drops, the water becomes uh, really murky because there's sediment coming down into yeah. coastal areas and the seagrass dies. Okay. And so if you have loss of seagrass, then there's no food for the dugongs. 
So as we see these major floods along the Queensland coast, for example, we've got, we're finding that we've got years when the dugongs aren't breeding because dugongs need a lot of seagrass to grow and to reproduce and, mm -hmm. and it's just not happening. Now I've been really lucky to be able to photograph a whole bunch of whales and ID them and try to start some sort of database but I guess with the waters the way they, they are and they can be in Moreton Bay and around the place and shallow water too it can be quite low vis and, and murky so how do you actually ID them? Yeah good question so we can't use photo ID for dugongs because they all pretty much look alike. Oh, mm -hmm. you get the odd one that might have a, de a deformed tail or has some sort of um, pigmentation pattern or markings on them, but generally they all look the same. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we take a little skin scrape from them and then we can get a DNA fingerprint and each dugong is unique genetically. So we can identify our animals and um, you know unambiguously and forever so that works really well yeah but we have to get close to the animals to take a skin scrape oh that would be so great to be close to one and how do you do that well <laughs> we go out in little boats you have to have permits to do it and yeah. so we approach them and then I just lean off the side of the boat off the front of the boat and just use a little scraping device a little handheld device and take a little nick of skin and then we can identify them. And we can also sex the animal too mm -hmm. because we have genetic markers for males and females. And one of the neat things about taking a little skin scrape is that dugongs do that to each other all the time. So the males have tusks and they're always scraping other dugongs. So the, the little scrape that we do on them is actually you know, something that they're used to. And most of them don't even react when we take a bit of skin. So the skin scraping is a way of getting close to them and doing population level stuff. But if we want to know much more about the animals, we have to catch them. And so we have a way of catching them. Um, we just leap out of a boat and grab them. And, um, and then we can take our skin sample, but we can also measure the animal. We can take other samples as well mm -hmm. um, and get quite a lot of information about the health of the animal. However, if we want to really look at the health of the animals, we have to take them out of the water. Okay. And the reason we have to take them out of the water is that we can't take blood samples and urine samples and other things while we're holding them in the water. Mm -hmm. So we take them out onto the back deck of a boat and then we take our samples. We never do health assessment on calves. So we, we don't want to separate mums and calves at all. Mm -hmm. um, so all of our sampling of mums and brand new calves is just taking skin scrapes and then okay. we can match the genetics, then we can work out who the dad is. And then we, yeah. we've got the, the newborn calf identified so that we can follow them throughout their lives. Mm -hmm. How do you know which one is, or is it just really potluck, which one you have? It is sort of potluck. It's yeah. pretty random actually. And you know, the idea of doing a health assessment is that we want to know the health of the population mm -hmm. in general. So we don't really want to go for particular animals. We just want to get a random sample of animals each year yeah. and see how they're doing. Most of the population studies that look at changes in population size are done through aerial surveys mm -hmm. and they're done through James Cook University. Mm -hmm. So Helene Marsh's team does most of that. The work that we do is mainly looking at the structure of the populations along the coast, so looking at genetic populations, so you know where the populations of dugongs are, how connected they are to other populations, movements of animals between populations, and then we look at the basic biology of the animal. So it's a different approach. In Moreton Bay, we've been running a mark recapture program, which is catching, you know, between 100 and 200 animals every summer and then going back every summer, year after year. And we've been doing that now for 20 years. And so that gives us an idea as to the population trends. And what we've found in Moreton Bay is that it's pretty stable. Mm -hmm. Probably it's not the same case in other populations up the coast. Mm -hmm. There's evidence to show that dugong populations have dropped dramatically over the last 50 to 60 years. Yeah. I just got this as well that I thought was absolutely hilarious and very intriguing. Oh, <laughs> yeah. What are so they, Janet? <laughs> they're actually dugong poos. So yes, it's, it doesn't look that great, does it? But anyway, so we actually run some expeditions up along the Queensland coast to collect dugong poo. 
So dugong poo tells us a lot. So we can extract DNA from dugong poo, and mm -hmm. that's another way that we can look at population structure, so look at the genetic population structure along the coast. But we can also get other information from the poo. So we can run hormone analysis, and we do this um, for, for animals that we sample um, in Moreton Bay, and we can look at um, the age at maturity, um, whether they're reproductive or not, um, whether they're reproductively active, whether they're pregnant and so on. So we're, we're monitoring um, the reproductive hormones. Wow. The other thing we can do is that we can measure um, stress hormones, mm -hmm. so cortisol and, and other stress hormones, and so we can tell whether the animals have been subject to stressful events in the previous week or so. Mm -hmm. and, and we've found, for instance, that after some of the major floods along the Queensland coast, that the, their stress levels go up in response to not being able to find the seagrass. So you can monitor week-long stress? Yeah. In the poo? We can wow. because okay. um, dugongs have a 50 metre gut, so their intestines 50 metres long, and it takes about a week for a meal to move all the way through. So we can, when we um, sample what's in the poo, it's, it's an integrated um, look at what's happened in the previous week in the dugong's life. Mm -hmm. And I guess um, you, you don't exactly have a net um, in that image there, but everybody would want to know, are they sinkers or floaters? Okay, well, they ca these ones are floaters. When we're out collecting them, we, we don't get to, to sample the sinkers except when the tide goes out. So we'll go to an area where dugongs have been feeding in an intertidal area. We'll wait mm -hmm. until the tide goes out and the dugongs go out, and then we wander around on the, on the mudflat and collect the sinkers. Okay. On a recent trip that I was on, I was talking to a lady, she actually collects scats and she po collects them and then she posts them in. Now, would you like anyone, if they happen to find any, any poo, to be <laughs> posting them into? Well, they could. It's always useful. <laughs> as long as they can tell us exactly where they found it, so get a, a good location. Oh, and it a probably GPS would, mark. Yeah, and GPS they, mark. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we'll, we'll, and we'll accept them. We'll put your address and personal okay. address on the screen um, for you so they can do that. <laughs> How do you tell the difference? Oh, you just have to assume until you test it. Oh yes, you mean tell whether it's a dugong yes. pill or something else. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a photo here of a calf that was reportedly um, found by itself um, on the Gold Coast oh, a yeah. couple of weeks back. Um, what, norm, what would happen with a calf that was found by itself without okay. its mum? Well, that's really not a good sign, actually, mm. and, and it's not good news for the calf because the calves stay with the mums for years. So that calf is a you know, really young one, and so it would still be feeding from its mum and probably for maybe five, six years. And, um, and they don't do well by themselves. So if that calf can't find its mum, then it's probably not gonna be great for it. So they're five or six years, they're taking um, yeah. milk from their mum for that duration yeah, of time. It's incredible. We used to think that dugongs were feeding from the well, calves were staying with their mums and feeding for maybe 18 months or so, and that's a long time for a marine mammal. Mm -hmm. But from the work that we've been doing, um, we've found that the calves are with them for years. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it seems that it's the male calves that stay with the mums the longest. So we've, re we've recorded um, male calves that are getting pretty big, still, still feeding from mum, and that she'll, they'll stick right with her until she has her next calf. And so dugongs have calves every in Moreton Bay every five to seven years. Mm -hmm. And so they, they go from feeding one calf and through a pr next pregnancy and then they're straight back to feeding the next calf. So it's really wearing wow. and tiring for the mums. That's a lot of seagrass that they have to eat. Exactly. Yeah. So they're not weaned. Do they... During that time, do you know if they start if the calves also start eating seagrass yeah, as well? So they do pretty early on. So okay. probably when they're three or four months old, they'll start nibbling on the seagrass as mm -hmm. well. But then it, they'll still take the milk for, for many years. So mm -hmm. dugongs are really unusual. They're, dugongs are one of the slowest breeding marine mammals on the planet. Do you know what the population number is? 
Um, we know that in, in Moreton Bay we've probably got between about 850 and 1,000 animals. Oh, okay. So, and we've, um, we have ident identified via the skin scrape and the mm -hmm. DNA fingerprint um, over 700 of those. And they've all got names, mm -hmm. so we know about 700 animals out there. Mm -hmm. Is there anything particular that, about the dugongs that you would just love to know? What would it be? Yeah, okay, there's a few things. One thing I'd really like to know is why their gut has no sand in it. So these animals have a 50 metre long gut and mm -hmm. they're feeding in sandy and muddy areas. They're digging up the seagrass. They're causing these huge plumes of you know, silt around them. And yet when you look in their gut, the gut of a dead animal, you find about a teaspoon full of sand and that's it. So somehow they're managing to eat this seagrass without taking sand into their gut. So that's a real mystery. And because the dugongs are such an urban animal being so close to cities, um, is there anything particular that you know we, we as ocean lovers and um, coastal users um, that we need to be more conscious of? Because we share coastal habitats with dugongs, we're their greatest threat. Mm -hmm. um, and humans need to do a number, can do a number of things. Yep. First of all, if you're out and about and you see dugongs, it's best to stay away from them so that they're not disturbed when they're feeding and mating and doing whatever else they're doing. So that's really important mm -hmm. to drive your boat slowly around dugongs because they can be prone to being hit. Um, the other really major thing is to try and conserve and protect the seagrass beds because dugongs rely on seagrass beds for everything. So their, their growth rate, their reproductive rate, their health, everything depends on being able to get access to really good healthy um, seagrass beds of particular species. Mm -hmm. And that means protecting them from pollution, mm -hmm. from litter. We've got major problems with coastal runoff after storms, but at other times too we're finding that um, there are levels of heavy metals and various pathogens that we know come from terrestrial environments now mm -hmm. found in dugongs. Mm -hmm. We're finding um, heavy metal profiles in dugongs which are indicative of different activities that have been occurring in the coast. So for instance in areas where they've been gold mining we're finding arsenic and various other metals associated with those, those mining activities showing up in dugong tissue. Also cane farms, you know, yeah. the pesticides and things that are used on in farms along the coast, yeah. we're finding those in dugong tissues as well. So dugongs are telling us about the, the health of our coastal yeah. um, marine systems. We've just done a study where we've found that dugongs near cities in Queensland are resistant to antibiotics. They're resistant because we're flushing these antibiotics out into our sewage system and then they're going out into wow. the bay and into coastal environments. Yeah. Simple things like kitty litter. Don't put your kitty litter down the, into the toilet mm -hmm. because we've found that toxoplasma, which is a protozoan parasite found in cats, goes through the kitty litter and we've found it in dugongs now. Oh, you found that in dugongs? So even seven, ten kilometres off the coast, yeah. we're finding dugongs are affected by contaminants that uh, mm -hmm. have originated on land. How long does it take for these toxins to show up? We find that after floods, we're finding higher levels of circulating contaminants, so in their blood. And then when we um, look at dead animals coming in, we find that those contaminants tend to accumulate in the tissues. So through time, they don't necessarily shed those contaminants or rid their bodies of those mm -hmm. contaminants, but rather they bioaccumulate. All these health assessments that you've been doing over the years, and you need more than two hands to collect all those poo samples. That's right. <laughs> So have you been working with the same team all these years? I have the most amazing team, dedicated team, highly skilled people. I have a research assistant who's been with me for um, over 20 years, Helen, and she's absolutely integral to the program. But I also have a team of um, experienced dugong catchers and handlers and samplers who have been with me for about the same length of time. And they're just fantastic people. The other people that are really important are SeaWorld. 
SeaWorld. Mm -hmm. So SeaWorld on the Gold Coast have been supporting my research now for um, about 20 years. Oh, um, great. And they make available their research vessel and their personnel and they're, they're a really important part of the health assessment team every year. That's really important because we need that sort of in-kind support, um, otherwise these health assessments wouldn't run. And being a long-term study, funding must be pretty scarce for yeah, you. Yeah, we have some years where we have virtually no funding and mm -hmm. it's a constant struggle to get funding. So there are very few projects that have gone for so long and we have to keep going because the generation time of dugongs is probably about 15 years mm -hmm. and you really need to sample animals through multiple generations to start to get an idea as to how the, the animals live and how their populations thrive. Almost 40 years later Janet, are you still in love with dugongs? Yeah, okay, that's, I do love dugongs. <laughs> I don't think people give them credit actually for how smart they mm -hmm. are, for being able to find their seagrass in, you know, under different, difficult circumstances and deal with fluctuations in seagrass and find their mates and teach their young. And mm -hmm. So I have a lot of respect for the intelligence of dugongs, um, but they're also just really nice animals. They're not necessarily the most docile of animals because, you know, they, they can be aggressive and fight and we also find ones that can be quite feisty, mm -hmm. so their personality is different. But they're really, I don't know, they come across as an intelligent and thoughtful animal. Mm -hmm. So yes, I do like them.